True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome back to True Crime South Africa, episode 100, The Murder of Siam Lee. This is part two of this episode. If you haven't listened to part one yet, you've missed a whole lot. So start there and come back here afterwards. In part one, we met Siam Lee and followed her through her early life to the point where she began offering essential massage services at the establishment she and her mother worked at in Durban North. Also in part one, we met a man called Pilani Ntuli, biochemist and businessman, who'd been accused of several rather horrendous crimes, including rape and assault. In October 2017, Pilani Ntuli saw Siam's advert on the Red Velvet website and booked a sensual massage with her. Nan Lee says that no alarm bells went off when she first met Ntuli. She said he was well-spoken, friendly and had a very wide smile. To her, he seemed no different than the countless other successful businessmen who frequented the establishment she'd worked at. And while neither she nor Siam seemed to really have any major impression of the man beyond an ordinary appointment, he did seem to find this initial meeting particularly important. Ntuli took a significant interest in Siam almost immediately, and soon after this first meeting, he requested a dinner date with her. This is another service that's offered within the range of sex work or escort services. Sometimes clients just need a woman to accompany them to either a specific function, or they want to have dinner with them. Depending on the worker in question, this may or may not end in other services being offered. Nan says that the dinner dates was just that, dinner. Ntuli arrived at the house in his black Mercedes Viano. Nan calls the vehicle a loaf of bread, and I guess it does look like one. She says that she introduced herself as student in training's mother, and indicated that her daughter should be back by 10pm and no later. Ntuli had agreed, and he and Siam set off. Nan says that Siam had returned at the stipulated time, but the minute she'd walked through the door, she declared she never wanted to see Ntuli again. She described him as weird and creepy. Nan says she laughed it off at the time, figuring they probably wouldn't see the man again, but this was not to be. Soon after the dinner date, Ntuli continued to message Siam and request additional appointments with her. I did really want to find out exactly how frequently he'd been messaging her and what the nature of the messages were. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find out much about that in the public domain, but many sources do say that Ntuli became quite irritating to Siam. We also don't know for sure whether she actually saw him again after that dinner date, but it seems clear she did not feel comfortable around him. Another thing I wondered was how Ntuli got Siam's direct number. The advert on Red Velvet clearly says that no private DMs or calls would be entertained, and surely the entire point of running through a service like that and working out of an establishment like the one in Durban North, is to maintain as much anonymity and protection as possible. But Ntuli did have Siam's number, and he used it as much as he could. Throughout November and December 2017, it's alleged that Ntuli's pursuit of, of Siam continued. I'm certain that if this case had made it to court, more information would have come forth about the nature of these messages and her reaction to them, but that was not to be. Although Ntuli remains only an accused in this case, we can look at the type of behaviour Lakim Tembu says he displayed toward her and I think draw some decently accurate conclusions about what Siam may have been experiencing at that time. 
The sex workers advocacy organization last heard from Siam Lee on the 26th of December 2017. When she reached out to the counsellor she'd been chatting with to say she had some clothing she wanted to donate. On the 31st of December 2017, Siam and her mom attended a dance festival in Durban to ring in the new year. Siam seems to have picked up a virus at this festival and fell ill. On the 2nd of January, she posted on her Instagram page with photographs of her, her mom and an unidentified older male at a river where they seemed to be enjoying a day out. Siam said it was a lovely day, but her immune system had let her down and she wasn't feeling well. At some point between the 31st of December 2017 and the 4th of January 2018, it's believed that Siam had had enough of Pilani and Thule's incessant messages and requests to meet up with her, and she told him in no uncertain terms that she wanted nothing more to do with him. At around 3pm on the 4th of January 2018, CCTV outside the house where Siam and her mom were living in Durban North shows a black Mercedes-Benz Viano with Kauteng number plates pulling into the driveway of the home and entering the premises. There are two stories in the public domain about what happened next. One is that Siam was standing outside the house, barefoot and wearing a flowing summer dress, when the black Mercedes van pulled up. The driver got out, armed with a gun, forced Siam into his vehicle and drove off. The other story is that Siam was in her room when her abductor arrived. He forced his way into the house, went to her room and took her from there into his vehicle. I tend to think that the former story is the more accurate one, because it appears more frequently in reporting around Siam's case and seems more plausible. It is entirely possible that the driver of the van had had contact with Siam at some point that day, perhaps told her to wait outside the house as he wanted to speak with her or give her something, and then when he'd arrived, he'd forced her into the vehicle. Siam was not wearing shoes, so it's clear she did not intend to leave with the driver of the vehicle that day. Because this case did not end up being presented in court, the minute details about when she was reported missing, what information was initially given to police, and the like, are not in the public domain, but we can draw some relatively fair conclusions from the information that is available, although many questions remain unanswered. Several sources say that one of Siam's co-workers had witnessed her abduction. I don't know where the police were called at that very moment, or whether Nan Lee was at the house when it happened. Another aspect that's never been clarified is whether anyone actually thought about Pilani Ntuli as a suspect at this early stage. I tend to think that he was either not actually on anyone's radar, or the people at the house didn't know his real name. In early reports of Siam's disappearance, the description of the vehicle is given, but it just says the vehicle has GP number plates and some articles say that the registration number of the vehicle was not visible on CCTV footage. Although we do not have certain details of the police reaction to the missing persons report about Siam, it certainly seems, and Nan would later say, that in the early hours and days of her disappearance, police didn't seem to react with the vigour that her family and friends would have expected. The reason I say this is that within days of Siam's disappearance, both family members of hers who lived in Australia and Nan Lee herself had employed the services of two different private investigators to work on her case. Brad Nathanson was reportedly contacted by Siam's father's family in Australia, which I found quite interesting and wondered how that came about. Her friends that I spoke to didn't mention her having spoken of a relationship with her paternal family, so I considered that perhaps Nan, in her desperation to find Siam, had contacted the family for financial assistance, and they decided to appoint a PI themselves, perhaps to have closer control of how the investigation was handled. 
Nan, though, would end up approaching a different organization called Moby Claw for help, and both organizations would carry out investigations into Siam's disappearance with varying, though equally interesting, outcomes. On the 7th of January, Nan, accompanied by her close friend, appeared in a Moby Claw Facebook video pleading for the return of Siam. Although Siam's disappearance was followed intensely by social media users, including her friends and family, the media took some time to pick up on her case. The first real coverage I can find about Siam's disappearance was on the 10th of January. Of course, media coverage predominantly focused on Siam's occupation at the time of her disappearance, with almost none of the articles failing to use the words sex worker or escort as a descriptor in front of her name. Another major focus around this time was the shock of Durban North residents that they had an establishment serving sex work in their neighbourhood. The direct neighbours of the home had, of course, long understood that the home was not an ordinary family setup, but sordid descriptions of this hidden house of ill repute in a leafy suburban area peppered many of the earlier articles around this case. So this became the focus, and when it became known that Siam's mother Nan was also a sex worker, and allegations were made that she'd groomed her daughter into the trade, the sensation exploded, and along with it, the judgment of Siam and her mother. Much of the public vitriol was targeted at Nan for what many saw as her having put her daughter in harm's way. More than ten days would pass without any word on Siam's disappearance, but then several things would happen at once that would fast-track the investigation and an eventual arrest. Now, if you have any passing knowledge of this case, you may have wondered why, considering where we are in the timeline, I haven't mentioned Siam's body having been recovered yet. And this was one of the big surprises I got when I started researching this case. The general idea that would come from later reporting would be that Siam went missing and her body was found and the arrest was made. But that's not really what happened. Police and private investigators were still searching for a missing Siam Lee as late as the 12th of January. On the morning of the 7th of January, though, a farmer and his grandson who were walking through a cane field in New Hanover, 100 kilometres from where Siam had disappeared, made a gruesome discovery. The pair came across a badly burned body of what was eventually determined to be a young female. Police were called and the scene was photographed and the remains were eventually removed and sent to a mortuary for autopsy and identification. And now you might be thinking what I am, right? Well, I'm sure considering Siam's disappearance had become such big news, someone within the SAPS had gone, okay, young female is missing, here's the body of a young female, let's see if it's our missing person. Well, no, that's not what happened. What actually happened is that a few days after the discovery, a photographer from Times Live, Jackie Clausen, was in court on assignment. She was tasked with taking photographs of a case that was in court that day, and during a break, she happened to overhear a rather disturbing conversation. Two police officers stood waiting for a case they were to testify in to be called, and they were discussing the case of a young female who'd been found deceased and with her remains burned in New Hanover on the 7th. From the sound of it, the condition of the deceased was particularly terrible, but the cops mentioned one thing that got Jackie's brain ticking. The deceased victim had a piercing in her lip. Now, photographers have a keen eye for detail. There's no doubt about that. And they'll see things in photographs that many others won't. Jackie could not help but think about the photographs she'd seen of Siam Lee, because she too had a piercing in her bottom lip. 
At the time, the officers had moved on, and Jackie had gone back to her task at hand. But the information continued to niggle at her, and when she got back to the office, she approached her boss. They both agreed that there was something to this, and it was important to make sure the police had also made this connection. It turned out they hadn't. Not yet, at least, and maybe they would have eventually, or maybe they wouldn't. By that point, the unidentified victim had already been laying in the morgue for several days, and the major identifying characteristic, a relatively uncommon piercing, had not been a factor that had been searched against missing person reports. It was a characteristic that appears in every single one of the missing person posters about Siam from that time, so we know it was in the police report, but it took an eagle-eyed photographer to spot it, and only by chance, because she was in exactly the right place at the right time to overhear that conversation. When police discovered that the victim they'd had since the 7th might be Siam Lee, they contacted her family. Although a visual identification would be extremely difficult, considering the unidentified victim had sustained burns to 90% of her body, and there seemed to have been significant head trauma as well, which had damaged her facial features, Nan Lee did go out to the mortuary to attempt to identify the remains. I cannot even imagine the horror of seeing anyone in that condition never mind someone who could possibly be your child. Nan explains that although her face was unrecognisable, what had remained of her hair, as well as one single hand that had been protected from burns and bore nail polish that Nan knew Siam liked to wear, told her that this was almost certainly her daughter. DNA would later confirm that the remains found in the cane field in New Hanover that day did indeed belong to Siam Lee. The young woman had experienced significant blunt force trauma to her face and significant burns to her body. Again, as there would never be a court case around this, we do not have a pathologist's report that was read into evidence. Some sources claimed that the autopsy had found smoke in Siam's lungs, indicating, horrifyingly, that she may have still been breathing when her body was set alight. Although these sources still appear when you search for information around this case, almost all the articles that refer to this have either been removed or archived, so I can only wonder whether this information was actually correct and I truly hope it was not. As Siam's family and friends reeled with the knowledge that the young woman had been so brutally murdered, in the background, a lead was coming in that would break the case wide open. A man who'd been driving in Durban North, just two streets away from the house Siam was, was abducted from, phoned Brad Nathanson to say he'd been involved in a car accident with a black Mercedes panel van around 3pm on the 4th of January. The man said that the van had ploughed into him after skipping a stop street and then fled the scene. He chased after the van and ended up crashing into the back of it in an attempt to stop him. The van had sped away though and he'd lost the man. Brad Nathanson reported on his Facebook page that upon receiving this tip, he'd used information from an insurance company to identify the address to which the vehicle had been registered. He also says that the vehicle was not registered in Pilanin Tuli's name, but the minute he brought the house up on Google, he realised it was one of the houses that he and Kate had looked at back in 2016 when they were looking for the place she says she was taken to and raped. Nathanson says that this is when he'd put two and two together and realised that the two cases may be linked and the common denominator may be Pilani and Tuli. Between the point of identifying the suspect and his actual arrest, things are a little murky, 
and Thule's defence team would make significant allegations against Nathanson during his bail application, which we'll deal with a little later. On the morning of the 16th of January, though, it is clear that entrance was gained to the property of Pilani and Thule, and his garage was forced open. Inside the garage, Nathanson found a black Mercedes Viano with Gauteng number plates which had damage to the front and back of the vehicle. There are pictures on Nathanson's Facebook page of him and his team removing the vehicle from the garage on a flatbed. Now you may note that I have yet to mention the presence of the police at this scene, and that's only because it's unclear exactly when police actually arrived there and what the extent of their involvement was in the seizures and eventual arrest. Brad Nathanson says unequivocally that everything he did that day was with the consent of the police, and they had been present at Ntuli's house for most of the day. Ntuli was not at the house when they removed the vehicle, though, and Nathanson said that police members had needed to leave the scene to attend to other matters, and they'd tasked Nathanson with watching the house and arresting Ntuli if he arrived. After a few hours of parking slightly down the street watching the house, Nathanson and his team watched as Ntuli arrived home. The man pulled into his driveway, and perhaps noticing that his garage had been forced open, walked over and peered inside. He was met with a gaping empty space where his panel van had once been. Nathanson says that at this point, the man clearly realised something was up and tried to get back into his vehicle, possibly to flee the house. But the team had descended on him and arrested him. There are photographs on Nathanson's Facebook page of the arrest as well. As news of Pilani and Suli's arrest started to spread, although his name was initially kept confidential because Nathanson had convinced Kate to add her case of rape to the charge sheet, there were glimpses of his identity, and Lucky Mtembu, Pilani's ex fiance came forward regarding her experiences with the man. Lucky was horrified that despite her best efforts to make the police aware of the danger Pilani and Suli posed to women, he was now being accused of the most horrendous murder. The charges she'd laid almost three years before would be transferred and attached to the proposed prosecution of Ntuli for Siam's abduction and murder. Pilani Ntuli would be interviewed by police, and apparently P.I. Nathanson was present at that interview. It's claimed that certain admissions were made, but it would later become clear that Ntuli was going to plead complete innocence on all charges against him, so we must take that into account from a legal perspective, that any alleged confessions would have been challenged in court at some point. Nathanson says that Ntuli had admitted to abducting Siam, but the reason he gave for the abduction was not a sexually obsessed drive to possess the young woman. Rather, he says Ntuli claimed that when he'd first met Siam, he'd given her a loan of 50,000 rand. He claimed that she hadn't paid it back, and when she'd started ignoring his pleas for the money to be repaid, he decided to teach her a lesson and abducted her. Nathanson says that Ntuli claimed he'd taken Siam to his house in Controversy Road and handcuffed her to a balustrade on a stairwell inside the home and repeatedly raped her. Ntuli claimed that Siam had told him on several occasions during the attack that she was going to go to the police and have him arrested, and this is why he decided to kill her. He claimed that he'd first attempted to strangle her, but this had only caused her to enter some sort of seizure state, and he chillingly says that he thought he'd put her out of her misery, so he placed a piece of material over her head, and struck her several times with the hammer. He then loaded her into his Mercedes Viano, drove to a nearby petrol station, and purchased 25 litres of petrol. The ordeal had lasted more than two days, 
with Siam being abducted on the 4th of January at 3 p.m. and eventually being killed, dumped and her remains set alight in New Hanover on the evening of the 6th of January. Two pieces of evidence would seem to support this version. Although Ntuli did not have a tracking device placed in his car for his own purposes, he was unaware that the Mercedes Viano he owned was factory fitted with a tracking device by Mercedes-Benz. Data from this tracking device placed him in the area of New Hanover on the evening of the 6th of January. The petrol station he'd purchased the petrol from did not have working CCTV cameras, but one of the attendants that worked there knew Ntuli, and he'd confirmed that the man had indeed purchased 25 litres of petrol that day. When Kate agreed to add her case of rape and abduction to Ntuli's charge sheet, she'd been asked to see if she could identify him in an identity parade. She was able to immediately point out Ntuli as the man she'd known as Oscar, who'd abducted and raped her in 2016. She was also able to confirm that the inside of the man's home at Controversy Road was the same home she'd been taken to. Between January and February, Ntuli appeared in court on several more occasions. His charge list grew, and as the additional charges were read out in court, the man shook his head. In March 2018, Siam Lee was eventually laid to rest. Her body had been held for further testing, and in a private send-off with her family and friends present, her ashes were scattered and a memorial service was held. In that same month, Pilani and Tuli began what would become a very protracted bail application. Although no one could know it then, this would also be the only opportunity for most people to hear a lot of the evidence against the man, as well as an idea of what his defence might be. During bail applications, much of the evidence against the accused will be presented so that the judge is able to get a good idea of the case against the defendant. The defendant will then also counter evidence where they can with their own evidence or testimony. Unfortunately, at this early stage, physical evidence is often not yet available, and we would never hear any evidence led about DNA or other physical evidence that may have been found in Thule's vehicle or in his home. Brad Nathanson did testify for the state about how he had identified Ntuli as a suspect and his subsequent actions. The defence were quite clearly on the attack with Nathanson and accused him of illegally detaining Ntuli as well as using torture methods to get a confession out of the man. Nathanson, of course, denied any wrongdoing saying that any seizures and the arrest were done with the full knowledge and under the instruction of police. Testimony was led that alleged that several illegal searches had been conducted of Ntuli's home, either by Nathanson or the police. It was alleged that no warrant was in place when these searches took place, and as a result, any evidence gained from them could be deemed inadmissible. The state asked the judge not to grant Ntuli bail because they believed he would intimidate witnesses and they also believed he was a flight risk. Strangely, they also said they couldn't have Ntuli out on bail because they believed that they could find trophies he'd kept from other crimes in his home. The judge, quite rightly I think, asked why almost four months after the man's arrest his home had not been properly searched already. While the bail application was ongoing, Nan Lee was seen in court several times. She spoke to journalists about the horror of hearing about the injuries her daughter had sustained. In May 2018, Nan Lee was arrested for damage to property after the landlord at the place she was living at had refused her entry because she hadn't paid her rent and the woman had attempted to break her way into the home to get her belongings. She was released on bail after being held for several days. During this time, she'd asked a friend to take the dog that she and Siam had together at Timberwolf to a rescue centre, 
as she realized she could no longer look after the animal. The animal was taken to a sanctuary for timber wolves in Bloemfontein, and Nan says that she hoped to be able to get the dog back when she was settled again because it was one of the last links she had to her daughter. In June 2018, Magistrate Mohammed Motala passed judgment in the bail application of Pilani Tuli. His bail would become a significant puzzle piece in the growing mystery around this case, and it also gives a really good rundown of the evidence the state may have had at that stage, and how, as it was alleged, this case may have been bungled. So I'm going to read the judgment to you. Quote, The state's evidence is that currently the cause of death, the place of death, and the date and time of death are unknown. The state relies on circumstantial evidence that the deceased left with the applicant. Two days later, her body was found burnt on a farm in New Hanover, and that the applicant's vehicle was tracked to that area. End quote. Mutala said that in building their case against the businessman, the state was placing heavy reliance on evidence gathered from the impounding of his car and the search of the man's home. He found that it was common cause, essentially that it was undisputed, that police and investigators aligned to P.I. Brad Nathanson had conducted repeated searches without a warrant. This, he said, could compromise the validity of the evidence and the outcome of his later trial. Quote, of fundamental importance in all of this, it is common cause that this all occurred on a normal weekday when the court at Pinetown, which is a short distance from the applicant's home, would have been available to obtain the relevant warrants. Why this was not done, beggars belief. End quote. Mortala said that while a bail court could not determine admissibility of evidence, it would be considered an exceptional circumstance based on what had been presented before him. He also noted the public outcry which followed Lee's murder, including that a petition to deny bail had been submitted by the state as evidence. Quote, a court cannot be seen to subvert its role and function at the altar of public opinion, or worse, become part of a lynch mob. As a responsible member of the community and a parent myself, I share in the grief of all those who were near and dear to the young Siam Lee, and it has pained me to listen to the details of her demise. It is hugely important for us as a civilized society that when I sit here, I fulfill the oath and promise of my office to act without fear or favor or prejudice, and adding to that, without influence of my own personal feelings. End quote. The judge found that the state's circumstantial evidence, coupled with the fact that the alleged murderer presented evidence that many people relied on him to survive, were exceptional circumstances in his favor when it came to bail. Quote, he personally, or via his business, supports his mother and his brother who is in a private school. According to his testimony, which the state challenged but was not able to disprove, he employs 17 people in the business he runs, thereby providing support for a dozen or more families. Since his incarceration, the employees have not had an income, and given the perilous state of unemployment in our country, one can assume that at least some of them find themselves in trying financial circumstances. End quote. Ntuli was granted bail of 40,000 rand. Now the judge's summary of the evidence presented thus far is really worrying. But we must consider that when a suspect is arrested, and even when court proceedings begin, the investigation has not necessarily ended. So it is entirely possible that, that by the time the trial would have started, the states would have had a stronger case. What does really concern me is the mention of what the judge considers common cause, meaning the state does not dispute, that some of the searches conducted in this case were done without a warrant. 
and there seemed to be no good reason why a warrant was not obtained. I would love the opportunity to get more information about this, but unfortunately I was unable to speak with anyone who could explain why this had occurred. We often see quite long gaps between when a suspect is arrested and a trial starts. This, of course, cannot be unreasonably long, and often there are various reasons for the delay. In Siam's case, by March 2019, a full year and two months after her murder, Pilani and Tuli had still not been asked to enter a plea, and he was still out on bail. On the 11th of March 2019, Ntuli attended a court hearing and he was assaulted by a protester outside the court who allegedly threw a rock at him. For the most part, Ntuli had looked like a healthy young man when he was arrested. Brad Nathanson would reveal that the man was living with the HI virus and that according to him, he hadn't found any antiretroviral medication in his house. This, of course, does not mean that the man was not on ARVs. As the legal proceedings continued, though, Ntuli began to look less and less well. On the 15th of May 2019, he appeared in court on crutches, looking significantly thinner than he had before and seemed to need to rest quite frequently. At that hearing, a pre-trial date was set for July 2019, but that would never happen. On the 21st of June 2019, reports began to spread that Pilani and Tuli had died. The NPA would later ask for this to be confirmed by means of fingerprints and physical identification, and they soon announced that they were certain that the man was indeed deceased. Reaction to this news was understandably varied. Lucky Mtembu admitted that she simply felt relief. With Nsuli out on bail, she'd been looking over her shoulder, and now she felt she could finally feel safe. Nan Lee initially said she also felt relieved, but then became quite angry because she felt Nsuli had literally gotten away with murder and she would never see justice for Siam. In speaking with journalists about this development, she mentioned that she'd always felt that police had let Siam down in the days after her abduction, and that if they had acted quickly, she may have been found alive. She said that now that Ntuli was dead, she was considering taking legal action against the police for what she saw as their failings. For the public, though, many felt that Ntuli's death didn't add up. His lawyer had said that the man had died of skin cancer. And this rather odd fact helped to stir up many conspiracy theories around whether the man had really died or whether he'd faked his death. After Suli's arrest, it emerged that besides the violent acts he was accused of, the man was also accused of basically being a bit of a con man. It was alleged by several people that Ntuli had taken their money as investments in a fake petrochemical company and that he'd been involved in several incidents of fraud. This knowledge, of course, only served to fuel the fires of suspicion, as many wondered if Ntuli was a con man, had he perhaps committed the greatest con of all and faked his own death? Brad Nathanson would say on his Facebook page at the time that he believed that Ntuli was dead. I will say, however, that I have been told by someone quite close to this case, who I'll keep anonymous, that they do not believe that Ntuli is dead, although they did not elaborate on exactly why they believe that. The timing of Ntuli's death is certainly suspicious. His pre-trial hearing was due in just a week from the day he died. The man had also never told the court he had cancer, and this would be a pretty helpful piece of information when he was trying to get bail. His lawyer did say that Ntuli had told him he was sick, but he hadn't elaborated on what the nature of his illness was. I think what got people really questioning Ntuli's death was the whole skin cancer thing. 
we know skin cancer as something relatively non-life-threatening in most cases. Of course, it can spread and then become very dangerous, but generally, if caught early, most forms of skin cancer can be cut out and treated. What is very important to understand, though, is the link between Ntuli having allegedly died of what is referred to as skin cancer and the fact that he was HIV positive. People living with HIV have an increased risk of developing three specific types of cancers. Included in these three is a cancer called Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma is a type of soft tissue sarcoma that has traditionally occurred in older men of Jewish or Mediterranean descent, young men in Africa, or people who've had organ transplants. HIV AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma causes lesions to arise in more than one area of the body, including the skin, lymph nodes and organs, such as the liver, spleen, lungs and digestive tract. Kaposi sarcoma is not common in HIV patients in the United States, but it is extremely common in South Africa. It was far more common before we introduced our antiretroviral program and the survival rate was also far lower then. In almost all cases, Kaposi sarcoma first presents on the skin of the upper and lower limbs. This would make sense, with Ntuli suddenly needing crutches. Ntuli was young, but if he'd contracted HIV in his early 20s, for instance, and had not been on a proper ARV program, he may well have been very ill by the time he was arrested. So I think when we consider whether Pilani and Tuli could really have died from what was referred to as skin cancer, the answer is absolutely yes, he could have. Because firstly, this was not a little mole on his shoulder, and his immune system would have already been hugely depleted. Now, on the other side of this, is it possible that Ntuli faked his death? Well, anything is possible. He could have paid off people to stage the identification. It would not be unheard of. In order for me to personally be convinced of this, though, I'd like to see some more evidence. Because this was a really high-profile case. And although our justice system is far from uncorruptible, there surely would have been checks and balances in place, and could all of those points have been corrupted? Maybe, but for me, there is more evidence pointing to the fact that Kaposi sarcoma is what took the man's life. The case was, of course, struck off the roll, and police convinced that Ntuli had definitely been their man, closed Siam's case. For me, one resounding question remains that I would love answered at some point. If this case had indeed proceeded to trial, what chance did the state have of actually successfully prosecuting Pilani and Tuli? For me, I don't have many doubt that he did indeed kill Siam Lee, but that's just my personal opinion. There's enough evidence to point to him as the perpetrator. But, in a trial, it's not about what you know, it's about what you can prove. And to prove something, you need evidence. Admissible evidence. Given that it's appeared to be common cause that warrants were not obtained to search in Thule's house, at the very least, we don't actually know whether that extends to the removal of the vehicle and his actual arrest too. Would the state really have been able to prove Ntuli's guilt? Was his death actually a bit of a stroke of luck? Of course, no one's death is lucky. For the state, in that they would never have to prove their case? Of course, there may have been evidence we aren't aware of. That's entirely possible. But it is really worrying that an investigation that started off seeming to have little regard for the safety of the victim, seems to have degenerated into a muddy mess when it came to the crux. 
After the death of her daughter's murderer, Nan Lee left KZN and moved to Bloemfontein. She told reporters at the time that she was planning on attending a rehab facility, but didn't specify what the treatment would be for. She also said she wanted to write a book about her and Siam's life, so that everyone could know the truth about who her daughter was and what had led to her murder. After this, Nan Lee has completely dropped off the map, and no one seems to know where she is. There are quite a few weird coincidences in this case, which only serve to increase the mystery level. You'll remember I told you to keep in mind the date on which Howard Greenspan, Siam Lee's father, was murdered. Yeah, it was the 4th of January, the same day, 13 years later, that Siam was abducted. Another weird coincidence is that in 2016, Siam did a photo shoot with a friend that she posted on Instagram. It was in a cane field. In a photo, she posted she's laying flat on her back, staring blankly at the sky above her. The caption reads, Don't mind me, I'm just laying in a field waiting to be abducted. Now, I'm pretty sure the quirky Siam meant abducted by aliens, but there's no doubt, given what would occur just two years later, that photo really was an odd harbinger of things to come. The last strange connection, although more just really sad than in any way coincidental, is the murder of Jessica Wires in 2020. To explain how Jessica fits into Siam's case, we need to rewind back to when Siam was still missing. Moby Claw, the organization assisting Nan Lee at the time, had received a tip that Siam had been seen at another establishment offering sex work in the KZN area. Moby Claw tracked this lead, and it led to a young woman, who at the time was referred to by the pseudonym Jane. Moby Claw immediately verified that this was not Siam, but took the opportunity to interview the woman in the hopes that she may be able to provide some information. They say that what she revealed to them was terrifying and pointed to a possible human trafficking ring operating in the sex trade in KZN. The following is a quote from their article about their meeting with Jane. Quote, Jane is estimated to be in her late twenties, in her own right very attractive, save for her teeth that have been rotted by drugs. She very quickly softens up to us when she realises that, that we're not there for her and looking for a missing girl and invites us into her flat. This is a hard streetwise girl, doesn't pull any punches with her mouth, says it like it is but we note little things. She has a cat. This cat loves her and won't leave her. There is a bedraggled Christmas tree in one corner. You soon realize this girl has a heart and somewhere deep in there, she's hurting and wanting for more, but the drugs have captured her soul. End quote. In 2020, Jessica Wires was found murdered with her hands removed in Durban. The members of Moby Claw immediately recognized Jessica as Jane, their source from 2018. Articles that covered Jessica's case relied heavily on this angle, espousing insider in Siam Lee case found murdered. Of course, this was just a way to ride on the public opinion that Pilani and Tuli was not really dead, and perhaps insert some intrigue around whether Jessica's death could somehow be linked. Of course, the truth around Jessica being an insider in Siam's investigation was that she really wasn't. Yes, Moby Claw had spoken to her at the time, but only because of a case of mistaken identity – and the information she'd given the investigators hadn't been linked specifically to Siam's case at all. Funny how headlines can be weaponized 
to make us think something when something entirely different is true. Jessica's case, of course, highlights the serious threat of violence that sex workers live under. And it also highlights how, even if police are all in on solving a case, considering most murders of sex workers are committed by people who are relative strangers to them, it is extremely difficult to apprehend the killer. Siam's case was different, because Polanyi and Thule had ingratiated himself into her life. There is absolutely no proof that she really owed him 50,000 rand. And even if she did, his actions do not correlate with a loan. Also, Pilani seemed to be a pretty savvy businessman. Why would he lend a 20-year-old girl he barely knew that kind of money, even if she was attractive? There was a lot of public interest in Siam's case, but I really think it was for all the wrong reasons. The sex work aspect drew the most attention, and it was Siam's angelic looks, really, and her mother's alleged involvement in grooming her that made that aspect gawk-worthy for the public. If those aspects had not been present, if Siam hadn't been the graduate of a private school, would her case have gotten as much attention as it did? If Siam had been a long-time sex worker on the streets, addicted to drugs and stuck in a negative cycle, would anyone have even known her name? That is the one aspect of this case that is worth pondering. But the truth is, Siam deserved as much attention as the next person. But she didn't deserve the labels and indictments that went with it. She certainly didn't deserve to become a one-dimensional representation of how society chose to remember her. Personally, I don't see any value in blaming Nan Lee. Although she's made statements in the past that seem to attempt to downplay her own responsibility in her daughter being involved in sex work, I do think that Nan lives with deep guilt every day of her life and the anger of strangers won't change that. The other side of this is, did Siam really die because she was involved in the sex trade? Yes, the man who's believed to have killed her did meet her that way, and it's unlikely she would have crossed paths with Ntuli any other way. But the more I dug down into the bare bones of this case, the more I started to notice the deep similarities with the murder of Erin van Rensburg. I covered Erin's case in episode 99 of the podcast. Erin was murdered by a man who'd become obsessed with her and whose advances she'd turned down. She had met the man quite by chance and did nothing to invite his obsession. Despite this, her killer targeted her and planned her rape and murder. He discarded her body in the sand dunes on the Cape's west coast. Her killer had also harassed her by text and continuously tried to make arrangements to see her. Erin had used exactly the same words as Siam to describe the man who would eventually take her life. Creepy. Weird. But Erin was not a sex worker. She was a university student, but both women fell victim to predators. So what is the common denominator here? Not sex work, not being a university student. The common denominator is that they were women who each found themselves in the path of a man who believed that his needs and desires were worth more than their lives. And as much as it might be tempting to focus on the salacious bits of this case and lay blame at the doors we think it belongs at, that's actually too easy. Because Siam's murder is very simple. Siam is Erin. Erin is Siam. Two completely different young women with two very different backgrounds and identical endings. 
Siam was much more than we've ever been introduced to. She was a deeply complex person who cannot and should not be defined by the way she earned money in the last few months of her life. In covering Siam's case, I desperately wanted to have a deeper insight to share with you into who she was and how we should be remembering her. So I reached out to a few of the people who'd asked me to cover Siam's case. People who knew Siam, not people who think they knew her because they read about her once in an article. Two such women responded to me and wrote beautiful pieces about Siam that they've agreed I can share with you, and I'd like to do so to end this episode. The first is by Emma Backman and reads as follows, quote, I met Siam in 2014. We had a few mutual friends, but our friendship didn't blossom until later that same year. I was an aspiring photographer back then, and had these crazy artistic photo shoots I wanted to do. Siam was the only person who believed in me, and understood my creativity. After our first photo shoot together, it was like I was blessed with an older sister. She was a great mentor and someone who I could ask questions to without any judgment. I will never forget the day I heard Siam had gone missing. I tried staying positive. I remember still thinking, she's just run off with a boy somewhere. It's such a Siam thing to do. But when I heard they'd found her body, my life came crashing down. She was such an inspiring person who had always had time for the people she cared for. I miss her dearly, and every few months dive deep into her case, hoping to maybe find something that someone has missed. Anyone who knew her would say the same thing. She was the warmest soul, and you couldn't stop smiling when she entered the room. She was an absolute ray of sunshine in anybody's life. End quote. Emma has also kindly shared a few photographs from those quirky photo shoots with Siam, which I'll share on Instagram. Emma has gone on to become a professional photographer, and I think that's a pretty cool part of Siam's legacy. The second piece I want to share with you was written by T. I know her full name, but I'm not sure if she'd want me to share it, so I'll just go with how she signed off her piece. T is what I would call a victim's advocate. She's an insanely strong young woman who is talented and caring and super smart. She, I believe, is who Siam would have been had she had the opportunity. T wants to work in activism against human trafficking and she has some seriously amazing ideas about how to combine technology with law to create solutions to help combat human trafficking. As a sidebar, and T is probably going to shout at me for doing this, but I'm going to anyway, T is currently trying to fund furthering her law studies, and she's struggling as she's seen as too old for bursaries. She's in her 20s. So if anyone out there has a couple of extra hundred thousand rand lying around or access to a grant or bursary, please reach out and I'll put you in touch with this incredible young woman. I think that would be another pretty amazing way to honor Siam. So here to end out the episode is T's dedication to her friend Siam Lee. I met Siam Lee at Crawford North Coast. We went to the same high school together. I was two or three years older than her, and I've never been so honoured to have made a friend like Siam. If someone were to ask me how I would describe Siam's personality, I'd say she was friendly, quirky, and extremely animated. I treasured taking the school bus with her when it was time to head home because we would talk about the most funniest and randomest things that kept us entertained. Her nickname was the Siamese Cat, 
not only because the nickname was a comical extension of her first name, but because she was unconventionally beautiful. Her expressive eyes stood out the most, which blended very well with her animated personality. When I first heard of Siam's missing case, I was in severe shock. I left to a different high school very suddenly and never received the opportunity to say goodbye to her. One day I randomly came across her photo on my Instagram page and I immediately blurted out her name out of excitement as I saw the opportunity to catch up with an old friend. It took me a minute to realize it was a missing poster of her being illustrated. When the case was finally concluded as a murder case, it drove me to tears. The brutality that Siam experienced was too much to handle, particularly when this was experienced by a young girl I had known in person. I think all my former peers and classmates were equally as traumatized as I was. I remember when I'd heard of Siam being murdered, I got in touch with a peer and we were both breaking down. Siam will be greatly missed and loved forevermore. My regret is not saying goodbye to her when I left our high school and just thanking her for being such a beautiful girl who had brought nothing but good memories to me and treated me well in my entire high school journey. Rest in peace. Power and grace, beautiful girl. Thank you for everything. And I'm sorry the world will never get to experience the pure joy you brought to me and many others at Crawford North Coast and beyond. T. Siam Lee, rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 100, The Murder of Siam Lee. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Hold up. 